This is the national debt clock. It's been in New York since the late 80s, and it shows the gross national debt that we as a nation owe countries, companies, and people that lent us money, almost exclusively in the form of bonds. Back in 1989, it was just shy of $3 trillion. Today, it's north of $30 trillion. And if you look at it by household, there's a reality check, more than $300,000 owed per household. Many worry that a confluence of factors is going to send the U.S. into a debt spiral. The U.S. routinely is spending more than the country and the government is taking in. So we are living beyond our means. As of this year, the U.S. is already spending more on the interest of its debt than on national defense. And that's not because military spending is decreasing. The reason is because servicing that debt has become so expensive. As it stands today, the U.S. Treasury Department spends $1.8 billion to pay the interest on our existing debt. By 2033, that number will be closer to $4 billion. The money that we pay every single day to finance our deficit cannot be spent on roads, bridges, or infrastructure for our children's future. It is just being spent to finance our deficit. So how did the U.S. get here? For two decades after the clock first appeared, the national debt was considered manageable. But that all changed in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, when two things happened. The U.S. economy shrank and borrowing increased. Our economy plunged and we had a lot of deficit spending to try to revive it. And that's when the current trajectory really grabbed a hold of the country. By 2013, the continued slow growth, even though it had picked up in the rising debt, put it above 100% for the first time ever. So our debt was above the size of our economy. This comparison is known as the debt to GDP ratio, and it's often used by economists to gauge the fiscal health of a nation. Even though that was a high level, it pretty much stayed flat for about a decade. That is until everything changed. COVID happened and our borrowing catapulted higher, sending checks to businesses and consumers. The Fed did their part, cutting interest rates to near zero. While that was helpful, that ended up sparking a spike in inflation. That eventually led to higher interest rates as the Fed had to pivot to combat inflation. Shut down. Shut down. Shut down. The Democrats have never wanted to stop the amount of spending. How do you explain to taxpayers that that makes any sense? Every year, Washington plays political football, avoiding the hard decisions to balance the budget. An 11th hour compromise always saves the day, but it also kicks the can down the road because the underlying problem isn't fixed. This hasn't escaped the eyes of our U.S. credit rating agencies. Fitch recently downgraded the U.S. credit rating by one notch, taking it off AAA. It was a historic decision based on a lot of wrangling in Congress over our deficit. And it also had a lot to do with some of the political instability that the world has seen coming from Washington. Fitch predicted that by 2025, the debt to GDP ratio will be 118%. And that number is three times the average of other similar countries. They're basically saying, Washington, you are still on notice. But here's the thing. There are real life solutions for the U.S. to reach a healthy debt equilibrium. But as you can imagine, none of them are easy. One is if the economy simply grew stronger. We're currently growing, but not that much. So that may be highly unlikely to be the answer. Number two is that if in Washington they could agree on spending cuts. We would have to see cuts in healthcare, Medicare, military spending. Number three is if we could increase taxes, something else that politicians don't like to do, especially in election years. Rapid growth, spending cuts, and increased taxes were all elements of the Clinton administration's balanced budget, which at the time was projected to pay off the national debt by 2012. But the role that government played through the great financial crisis and the pandemic has changed the country's economic landscape dramatically. Democrats and Republicans alike have used a public purse to stave off catastrophe and rev up growth. Neither has made attempts to cut the deficit. It's really easy for Republicans to blame Democrats or Democrats to blame Republicans for the problems that we currently have in our trajectory. Both parties have made decisions that have led to the immense deficits that we have right now. 
As terrifying as the current debt trap is, what's more scary is that politicians in Washington are using it as a cudgel. We don't see enough moderates who are willing to reach across the aisle. Rather, parties are being pushed to opposite ends of the political spectrum so that it's gonna get harder and harder to find ways to face our poor fiscal management.